with uh, lecture by Professor uh, Vijay Mohan Mallai. Uh, and today, uh, Professor will discuss uh, time series econometrics uh, uh, in the first and sec second section, and uh, the third one, uh, hands on exercise with Gretel. Okay, over to you, sir. We can start. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So I shall share my PowerPoint. Yeah, yeah, sir. You can share it. I think you have with share option. So you can see this now, right? Yeah, right, sir. So okay. put it on slideshow mode, sir. That will be yeah. better. So I'm giving an introduction to time series econometrics. Some of the basic concepts I will explain here. And uh, then in the afternoon workshop session, we will do some practicals. Now, initially I shall give you some essential readings on time series. The the first one that I like most is, is Applied Econometric Time Series by Walter Endes. This is a very good book and an Indian edition is available in the market. Uh, there are some equations, but uh, you have to stand with those equations. But otherwise, this is a very good textbook. Then Hamilton's Time Series Analysis is fully mathematical, so if you are mathematically inclined, you can have this book. But the language of, language of this book is very interesting, unlike Walter and James. Walter and James, I found a little boring with regard to language. Then David Henry, I told you about Henry of London School of Economics earlier. He has a book, Dynamic Econometrics. This also is a little mathematical. Then, for the classical time series analysis, the first book is by Macridatis and others. We will write in Maggie. Forecasting methods and applications. This is a book, big book, but uh, very, very, very simply explained everything with the illustrations. A lot of examples are given. This is the best book for Arima modeling. The theory of Arima modeling. Of course, there are a large number of books in the market. For example, I have shown the financial econometrics books. So all those books are dealing with the time series analysis. Now I have two working papers, serious working papers. One already told you about the the tradition is questioned. Then there is another one, a contribution to peak load pricing. So he in, in both the papers and dealing with the certain time series concepts. Now I shall start with the time series process. Now see the time series econometrics is uh, is is say a little more mathematical. We will have a lot of equations and other things. So some equations we have to put up with. So I will be giving some equations. So I shall explain everything and some very new concepts will be there. Maybe some of you are already familiar with the time series econometrics, but otherwise for the beginnings, we will have a little more concepts to understand. So, time series is a stochastic process. A stochastic process is a sequence of a random variable ordered in time. Ordered in time means, or this is a collection of random variable that are ordered in time. Ordered in time means we have, say for example, by t, that is the present time by t minus 1, last period by t minus 2, the, the previous period of that. Then 
y t minus 3, y t minus 4, and so on, it will go back up to the last for the initial value y o. So when we collect all this in this order, then that is a stochastic process. Such a stochastic process is a time series process or simply time series. So a time series is a stochastic process or a random process, collection of random variables which are ordered in time. So we know a random variable takes values in a certain range with the probabilities specified by the probability density function that we already know. Now this stochastic process is generally called data generating process in time series econometrics. And this is the same as our population in statistics. So the population in statistics becomes a data generating process, which is a stochastic process in time series analysis. So whenever we say data generating process, remember, this is nothing but the population of the time series. Now the time series data is a particular realization that is sampling. So if we have a time series data that is a sample from the population, that is the data generating process. Now these are the notations that we use in time series. A time series variable y t we give. Uh, a time series variable we give in terms of y t, which is a random variable y at period 2. Now, a time series, as I told you earlier, is a collection of random variables ordered in time, so that this collection of random variables ordered in time, y t, y t minus 1, y t minus 2, and so on, the last, the initial y, y o. So this constitutes a time series process. From the time series process, if we get a sample, then we have a, then we have simply a time series. Now the capital T is the standard number of observations in a time series. In a cross section, we use capital N or simply small n. And here we use capital T for the sample size. So here we have a time series, for example, this is the per capita net stage domestic product of Kerala at constant prices. So we know it is arranged in order of time. And this shows the graph of this per capita net stage domestic product. And here we have the wholesale price index for all commodities in Kerala for certain months. I haven't given the full data. I have given the starting point 71, 72, this monthly data up to 87, 88. This is the graph of that data. Now, I shall, I shall give you uh, it is not given. I shall give you a brief history of time series analysis. Time series was initially conceived by a statistician in the 18th, 19th century called Fourier. And uh, this, he formally, he postulated that any time series can be approximated using trigonometric function that is using using the combination of sine and cos functions we can generate time series data so that the time series data can be approximated as the combination of trigonometric functions any trigonometric functions but it should be a combination for example combination of sine and cos variable or sine and theta, sine and say tan, and so on. Then, in the beginning of the 20th century, that is 1926, a British statistician called George Joule 
argue that any time series can be approximated in terms of a auto regressive process. An auto regression, you know, is a function of a variable in terms of its own past values. For example, by t as a function of its own past values, by t minus 1, by t minus 2, and so on. So any time series according to you can be approximated in terms of an AR process. Then, after nearly 10 years, in 1936, a Russian statistician, very famous Russian statistician, Slavsky, formulated that a time series can be approximated as a moving average process. A moving average process, as, as I already told you, is a function of a variable in terms of a random variable and its own past values. That is by t in terms of, say, epsilon t, which is a random variable, and its past values, epsilon t and epsilon t minus 1, epsilon t minus 2, and so on. So that is a moving average process. Then after about 20 years, around 1956, a Swiss mathematician, very famous mathematician, Hermann Wold, combined AR and MA process, and we have a theorem by him in terms of a decomposition theorem. And that decomposition theorem combines AR and MA process, and thus we have a new model that is ARMA, autoregressive moving average process. So here I am giving the AR1 process of by t, by t as a function of its own past value, by t minus 1. B is said to be the auto regression coefficient. And a maven process, as I told you, is expressing a variable in terms of a random variable ut and its lab divide. Here we have an ma one process because we are using only one lab. Here also we are using one lab. Therefore, we are we have an AR1 process. Now combining these two AR1 and MA1, we get an ARMA11 process. That is by t equals A plus B by T minus 1 plus U T plus D U T minus 1. So in this case, we have the lag the value of the dependent variable and the present value of a random variable U T and its own past values for a normal process. Now, what is actually this time series? This time series has a mathematical background. Hello. That anybody, if anybody sir, has uh, any, 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 any sir, doubt, you can ask me, right? Sir, or, sir. Uh, Sir, myself, Shantanu, sir. Uh, what is it? Hello? Somebody was asking something? Can you please go to the previous slide? Previous slide, okay. Yes. Yes, yeah, this one. Sir. Okay. Here, ah. Yes, sir. Sir, here actually AR1 and MA1 process is almost similar just the a additional intercept is considered in ar1 process isn't that no 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 no. they are not the same they are not the same in an ar1 process see the dependent variable is by t and as an independent variable we are giving its own positive value by t minus one and the random variable ut and we have an intercept here we can have an intercept here also usually it is not explicitly written but in ma process the dependent variable depends on the random variable ut and its past value ut and ut minus one so there is a difference vast difference what the idea sir, sir ut is a random variable yeah My, or the random, random error term, which one Random error, right. Random error, right. And its, and its ah. lag values. 
and its lag value previous value ah yeah, previous yes. value right yeah okay. that is mm process okay okay, sir. okay yeah. sir. so when we combine this we get this one here we have the lagged value of the dependent variable and the present and the lagged value of the there is some okay so yeah, okay sir okay sir in the norma process uh, in the norma process we have the lagged value of the dependent variable and present and the lagged values of the random error key so that is it now as i told you behind time series there is some mathematics because the AR process, the auto regressive process comes in terms of a mathematical equation. So that is why I have written type series this is stochastic difference equation. Difference equations, that particular branch of mathematics is the mathemat mathematics of dynamics. I have written here economic dynamics because it is not only used in economics, in general mathematics, we use that. So here, the difference equation deal with time as a discrete variable. If we consider time as a continuous variable, then instead of difference equations, we will have what is called differential equations. So these two are mathematical tools, differential equations and difference equations in in time series analysis we are considering the difference equations only so here the time is a discrete variable in the sense that it can be written as t t minus 1 t minus 2 t minus 3 and so on or simply t equals 0 1 2 3 4 and so on now the difference equation gives the value of a variable as a function of its own lagged values time and other variables for example when we write y t equals b y t minus 1 plus a t then we have a difference equation y t given in terms of its own lagged value and an intercept which is a function of time or we can write this as y t minus b y t minus 1 equals a t and this since we are using only one lag and all the games have a power of one this is said to be a linear first order difference equation so the power of yt is one power of yt minus one also is one at which is a function of time that also has a power one therefore this is linear this is first order because we have one lag by t minus one. Then this is a difference equation because this is given as the this is given in terms of y t as a function of its own past value. So this is a difference equation. Now usually for simplicity, this this b is a constant and the at is taken as a variable but it can be taken as a constant also so that we can write this as y t minus b by t minus 1 equals a now this is said to be a non-homogeneous linear first order difference equation with the constant coefficient and a constant b is a constant coefficient a is the constant this is linear because by t and by t minus 1 are having a power of 1. And this is first order because we are using only one lag. And this is non homogeneous because on the right hand side, a is not 0. If a equals 0, then we have a homogeneous difference equation. Linear first order difference equation with the constant coefficient. So this is the this is a difference equation. We will go a little detail in with uh, this difference equation because 
everything in ten series analysis depends on this difference equation, the properties of the difference equation. Now, if we include a random variable duty to this difference equation, mathematical difference equation, then we get a stochastic difference equation. And that stochastic difference equation is the AR1 process. This is an AR1 process. And that is a time series. So the AR1 process is nothing but a random difference equation, a stochastic difference equation. Now, UT, UT is called in different, by different names. UT is an equilibrium error. It, it is a disturbance. But in time series analysis, it is called an innovation. Now, can you tell me why it is called an innovation? Anybody? It contains information, sir. Uh -huh. Yeah, it, it is all, I, I have already given it here. See, consider this particular particular equation, y t equals a plus b, y t minus 1 plus u t. This y t minus 1 is already known to us. We know about the value of y t minus 1 because this is the past value of y t. So we already know, we have already information on y t minus 1. Any new information to this system, this system comes from only u t. New information comes only from UT, and that is why it is called innovation. Since it is UT is a random variable, it is an information shock. So information comes as a shock. That is why it is called information shock. Every innovation is an information shock. It's a it is random. So in time series analysis, UT is taken as an information shock, or it is called innovation. And this innovation is assumed to be a white noise process. White noise process. Now, what is this white noise? We already know about noise. Noise is the disturbance. UT is an error tape or a disturbance tape or noise tape. This tape, white noise, comes from signal theory in physics. So, in time series analysis, we have taken a lot of concepts from signal, especially from signal theory in physics. Now, you are already familiar with the concept of white noise because you have already familiar with the... Okay, before that, I shall, I shall show, you the, show you the graph of a white noise process. This is the calculated spectrum of a generated approximation of white noise. So, this one. And uh, this is the example realization of a white noise process. Example of a realization of a white noise process. We will come back to this uh, again. And uh, before that, let us see the, the properties of a white noise process. A, the property of the white noise process. See, as this spectrum shows, this has the flat spectrum this this is the flat spectrum so a flat power spectral density that implies that the distribution of the white noise has a zero mean a constant variance and a zero auto covariance which shows that there is no auto correlation and now you are familiar with this noise tape with these properties the last day I told you that if these three assumptions of the error tape are satisfied, then the error tape is called a spherical error. A spherical error. It is a spherical error. And this spherical error is the white noise in time series. So the white noise is nothing but a spherical error in time series. It has a zero mean. And it has homoscedasticity that is constant variance, and there is no autocorrelation for that. If these three assumptions are satisfied, then in time series, the error tape is a white noise, and it will have a time series plot like this. 
here the zero is the b the zero b now see can you tell me whether this white noise is stationary or not anybody just for the thing anybody stationary sir is it a stationary, stationary process? Is Main it a stationary device. process? Main yes, process. Ah, okay, you know, okay, 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 you know this. So we have a large number of mean reversion because whenever a, the time series approach goes up, it will come back to the mean and it will proceed, goes down. Then it will go back to the mean, goes up, come down. So we have a large number of mean reversions. So a mean reverting process is, is a stationary process. So these are certain equations. As I, as I have already told you, the white noise has zero mean, constant variance, and there is no autocorrelation. And we have another assumption about the normality but this assumption is not very essential. If this assumption also is satisfied, then the white noise is called Gaussian white noise because the normal distribution is called a Gaussian distribution because the, the normal distribution was formulated, it, the, it, it was, the, its originator was called Frederick Gauss. Now, as you know, white noise process is a stationary process, but not vice versa. That is, for a stationary process, mean, variance, and covariance all are constant. That means they are all independent of time. And this particular assumption of stationarity is called covariance stationarity, or second order stationarity or weak sense stationarity or white sense stationarity. This is the stationarity concept that we use in type series analysis. That is mean variance and covariance all are independent of time. But we can find that even though covariance is independent of time, it is a function of the lag. The lag is represented in terms of k. That is t minus 1, t minus 2, t minus 3 and so on. The k is 1, 2, 3 and so on. Or in general, t minus k. So covariance is a function of lag, but it is independent of time. Then we have a stationary process. So right now this process is a stationary process, but not the other way. That is a stationary process need no be by no means. So what is for particular uh, about the white noise and the difference between white noise and stationary process? For a stationary process, mean variance and covariance all are independent of time, they are on constant. What about the white noise process? Do you remember for the white noise process? mean is zero so it can be taken it, the, the, so it need not be constant then variance is constant then what else what are the covariance is it a constant for the white noise process it is zero okay you remember this one see the covariance is zero for the white noise it has zero mean constant variance and zero covariance. That means there is no autocorrelation. But for a time series, for a stationary time series, mean is a constant. It can be zero also, no problem. But it is a constant generally. Variance is constant. And that is so with respect to white noise process also. But covariance is not zero for a stationary process. It is a constant. It is not zero. So that is the difference between white noise and stationary process. 
So we can say that Schwendel's process is a stationary process, but a stationary series need not be by points. Because for a stationary series, the covariance is not zero. There is autocorrelation. There is autocorrelation. So that is the difference between these two processes. So we find that uh, yt is given in terms of the stochastic difference equation a plus b by t minus one plus ut, where ut is a white noise process. That doesn't mean that yt also is white noise or it is stationary. Yt may not be stationary. That depends on the magnitude of this coefficient, auto regression coefficient b. And it is B is taken as the root of a difference equation. This is the root of a difference equation. So whenever we say an AR process, then this coefficient is the root of the difference equation for the AR process. So B is the root of the AR process. Now we are going back to our difference equation y t equals b y t minus 1. Now given a difference equation like this, we can find its solution. That solution is taken as the time part of the difference equation. That is for every every time, how each the, the particular y t moves over the time, that is given by the time part. And that is a solution of the difference equation. And that is given. This is very simple to derive, but I am not giving it. So that particular solution of this difference equation is given in terms of y t equals y o b power t. B is the root of the difference equation, b power t. Now the nature of this time of y t, whether it converges or not, as time approaches infinity. That is asymptotically, whether it converges or not. That depends upon the sign and magnitude of the root B. So this, the sign and magnitude of this root B determines whether the time path converges or not. If the time path converges, then we say the system is stable. If the system is stable, then in the parlance of time series, we say that the system is stationary. So that stability of or the stationarity of the particular system or the equation or that particular variable depends upon whether this root converges or not. If it converges, then yt is a stationary process. If it diverges, then it is not a stationary process. So that is the important importance of the, the, the root of the equation. Now, for simplicity, we assume that y o equals 1, so that we can write y t equals b power, b power t, so that for different time periods, we can find out the time path of y t depending upon the value of b, magnitude of b, and its sign also. Now I am giving those cases. Now suppose the value of b, we are taking b greater than 1, or we are taking b is equal to 2, so that b power t we can write as 2 power t. As time changes from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, we get the time path of y t. So, 2 power t when t equals 0 is 1. 2 power t when t equals 1 is 2. Then it is 4, 8, 16, 32, and so on. What is happening here to our b power t, the time path of yt? The time path of yt, what is happening? It is increasing over the time. 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, and so on. It is increasing over the time. So, that means it is going away from the mean zero. We have a divergence case. 
So if B is greater than 1, for example, if B equals 2, we have the case this. Now the other things. We are taking the value B is equal to 1 so that the Y key becomes B power T, that is 1 power T. Here we have O 1. Do we have a convergence here? Is it coming back to 0? Not at all. So we have a position like this. There is no convergence. There is no convergence, but there is no divergence also. Okay, there is no divergence. There, but there is no convergence. Now we are taking B as less than 1, that is 0.5. So that our time path becomes initially 1, that is 0.5 raised to 0, 1. Then we have 0.5. Then the square of 0.5, that is 0.25, and so on. Oh, in terms of 1 by 2, we have 1 by 2, 1 by 4, 1 by 8, 1 by 16, 1 by 32, and so on. So what is happening here? We know that this is diverge, this is converging towards 0. So this is com coming back to 0. So when R is when the root B is less than 1, we have a case of convergence. Now we are taking B in as minus 1 by 2, minus 0.5. In this case, what is happening? The idea is as the, as the same as the above one. We have a convergence because the absolute value is decreasing. But what is happening? Every second chain is negative. So initially positive, then negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. That is we have an oscillation. We have a fluctuation around the mean. And we have a situation like this. So the convergence, we have a convergence through oscillation. We have a situation of convergence through oscillation. When does it happen? when the root is negative and less than 1. Now the other case. Now we have B, the root equal to minus 1. Here we do not have any convergence or divergence, but we have oscillation. That is, we have an oscillation like this, fluctuation like this. But there is no convergence. There is no divergence also. Now the final case, that is B is less than minus 1 or the absolute value of B is greater than 1. We are taking B as 2 so that we have minus 2t. What is happening here? We have divergence but the divergence is through oscillation. So we have oscillatory divergence. Now let us combine all these results. Let us pick up it. So we find that the first order difference equation, homogeneous difference equation, y t minus b by t minus 1, has a time path. It may be oscillatory or non oscillatory. It may be converging or dash or diverging or explosive. What are the conditions for that? The conditions we have already seen. We find we found that type of yt would be oscillatory if the root is negative. That is, if we have a negative root, and non-oscillatory if we have a positive root. And the type of will be converging if the root lies between zero and one, or it is less than 1 in absolute table. If, if the root is less than 1 in absolute value, then we have convergence. And we have no convergence because we are including the root, the case of root being equal to 1. So we have no convergence when the absolute value of B is greater than or equal to 1. So convergence and non-convergence. 
So let us recap it. We have a negative root means oscillation, positive root means non oscillation, and absolute value of the root is less than one. We have convergence. If it is greater than or equal to one, then we have non convergence. So with a unit root, that is, if the root of the difference equation is equal to one, it is called a unit root. So we find that with a unit root, there is no convergence. So that yt is unstable. The time back of yt is the system is unstable. That instability is the non-stationarity problem. So the non-stationarity is because we do not have a convergence. We do not have a convergence because the root of the system is not less than one. So I hope you understand that, right? So with a unit root that is B equals one, our first order difference equal, sorry, first order, of course, stochastic difference equation. That is our AR1 process. We can write as yt equals y t minus 1 plus ut. That means the we can find out the tangent of yt like ut plus ut minus 1 plus and so on. That is sum of all the past and the present random shorts summation ui. That is a cumulation of all the random shorts. That is the, the type of yt. And this sum of all the random paths shows is called a stochastic range. And that shows that the shock is persistent. That persistence of the stock is an indication of non stationarity. So sometimes instead of non stationarity, we also use the term. Persistence. That persistence means the shock is persisting over the entire time period from past to the present. So persistence is the non stationarity. And non stationarity problem is because we have a unit root or the root of the AR1 process is 1. So now with the unit root, we find that the, the mean of the system yt is equal to zero, but variance of yt is now, it is only, it is t times sigma v squared. t means time. So for a, remember for a stationary series earlier, we have seen that variance of yt is only sigma v squared, it is a constant. But with a unit root, it becomes sigma v squared multiplied by time. That means it is a function of time. So as time increases, as t increases, the variance also is increasing. Remember this particular case. Variance is a function of time. As time increases, the variance also is increasing over the time. Now, same is the case with the covariance of yt and yt plus k or t minus k. It is also a function of time. That means the covariance also is increasing over the time. So, if actually if we have a constant in our AR process, then we can find that the mean also is a function of time. We will get if alpha is the constant in the AR1 process, then the V will be equal to alpha t that I have been given here. So this we have already seen. Now the non-stationarity can be due to two cases. One is because of the presence of an integrated process or a different stationary process. Now see, 
a non stationarity process also is called by integrated process or difference stationary process. Why it is called by these names will be clear after some day. I shall explain this later on. And this non stationarity is due to the stochastic trend. We know the stochastic trend appears as the accumulation of all the past random shocks. That is ut, ut minus 1, ut minus 2, and so on. All the past random shocks. That is the stochastic trend. So, this can lead to a non stationarity problem. Similarly, we have non stationarity due to trend. Therefore, it is called a trend stationary process. Such process where non stationarity is due to a trend is called a trend stationary process. In this case, we can have both stochastic and deterministic trend. The deterministic trend is because of the time trend and the stochastic trend because of the non this this one, the stochastic one. If the root is equal to one. Stationarity is a somewhat unrealistic situation in most of the macroeconomic variables. So, a non stationary process arises when one of the conditions for stationarity does not work. So, this we have already seen when we have a unit root, we have the non stationarity problem. Such a process is also called a random walk. And in this case, since we do not have a constant, this is called a random walk without drift. A random walk without drift. Now, if we have a constant in this process, then it is called a random walk with drift. So, it is called without or with drift because the presence of A will give a trend for the mighty series. That is why the trend is called by drift. In this case, there is no trend. Therefore, this is a random one without drift. Now, if we take the first difference of this one, by t equals by t minus 1 plus ut. Take the first difference. That is, take by t minus by t minus 1. Then we will get delta by t. Delta by d is by d minus by d minus 1. And from this we find that that is equal to ut. That is the white noise, which is a stationary process. So delta by t now becomes a stationary process. So by differencing a random walk, we get a stationary process. So here y t is made stationary through first difference. We have taken the first difference by t minus by t minus one. If we have higher order of lag, then we can have higher order of difference. Now, since by t is made stationary through first differencing, this process, this random path process with or uh, without drift, or even with even with the with the drift, is called a difference stationary process or DSP. So we call a random walk or a non-stationary process different stationary process because we can make it stationary through difference. That is why it is called a different stationary process. It is called an integrated process because from the difference in the series we can come back to the original series through summation. So if we add by t minus 1 to delta y t, then we will get by t equals by t minus 1 plus u t. So that is the indicator. So that so we can call the DSP process or the random work also as an integrated process. So now we remember a non-stationary variable in time series we call as a random walk with or without drift. 
and it is also called a different stationary process for integrated process. Now, as I told you earlier, the process of inverse of difference in this integration. So that is why this DSP is called an integrated process. Now, with one unit root, we can make yt a stationary through first difference. Only one type of difference in this enough. Therefore, yt is integrated of order 1. And we write yt as i1. That is, there is one unit root. Now, the different series, that is delta yt, it does not, it is a stationary series. For a stationary series, there is no unit root. That is, we have zero unit root. Therefore, a stationary series we can write as integrated of order zero and write it as i zero. That means, there is no unit root. So, this is the usual notation that we use for the non stationary series as integrated series of order 1 or 2 or 3 and so on. And if the order is 0, if it is i0, that means we have a stationary process. Now, i2 means what? i2 means we have two unit roots in that particular system. The yt is integrated of order 2 with the two unit roots. So, we write yt, we write like this, yt follows i1 or yt is an integrated process of order 1 and delta yt is an integrated process of order 0. So, this is a notation that we use. Similarly, if a non-stationary series yt is transformed into a stationary one by differencing d times, that is delta d, okay, I am generalizing it. Then the series in level, that is the level variable yt, we say is integrated of order d. That means there are d unit groups. So we write it as id. Yt is id. There are d unit groups. So that also means that delta d yt, that is we have differenced yt d times. So we have delta d yt. It is a stationary process i0. Now here I am giving eight random words starting at 0. So, we have yt equals yt minus 1 plus vt depending upon the value of vt. We have 8 types of random marks. Now, here we have the random work in level and change. The level yt is given by this one. So, this is the level variable. So, the level variable is a non stationary y. And the change, that is the difference one, delta yt, is given as a stationary one. It is mean reverting process. So, this is the change variable or the difference variable. So, we have the level variable and the difference variable. So here also we have the same one. We have a level variable and the difference one. Now, whenever we have an integrated process of order D, then there is no tendency to return to zero. And that is what you see. There is no tendency to return to zero. But I0, we find that it rarely drifts from 0. It will be always mean revert. It is always mean revert. So the ID is, ID may be termed as a quantum. 
that is going away from the me and the other one i0 our station process is a mean reward now how do we identify whether we have a stationary series or a non stationary series and whether we have a stationary ar series or ma series or rma series and so on for that purpose in classical time series analysis we use a graphical device called porilogram this porilogram includes two types of representations one is what is called auto correlation function acf the other one is called partial auto correlation function pacf now the acf plots gives a bar chart of coefficients of the correlation auto correlation between a time series and its lag values and this explains how the present value by t of a given time series is correlated with the past that is by t minus 1 by t minus 2 and so on the past values that means the it is called a function because it is the correlations of a particular variable over the lag k that is why it is called a function it's a function of the lag k for here i have used the n now partial auto correlation function those who know multiple regression knows the multiple regression coefficients are called partial regression coefficients so the partial auto correlation function represents the actually it is the partial regression coefficient of the of our auto correlation equation partial regression equation so that that means partial correlation coefficients between the series and its own labs are nothing but the regression coefficients or the partial regression coefficients of our our regression function or our auto regression function so for example for a for a first order first order ar process that the 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 beta the root of the process beta is both the auto correlation function and the partial auto correlation function but when we come to the order 2 we have beta 1 and beta 2 coefficients these are the partial auto correlation functions but using these partial auto correlation functions we have to find out the correlation function the separate correlation function now i shall give you some the diagrammatic representation of these correlograms pa acf and pscf for some process now see we know this is a stationary process actually this is a white noise process so for a white noise process what is the nature of the acf and pscf that is what we are going to find out this time series plot i have taken in great so afternoon i shall show you how we get this so this is the time series plot of a white noise process then what are the correlograms acf and pscf of a white noise process so here we have the acf for the white noise process now you find two red lines here these two red lines are the limits for the confidence interval that is 95% confidence interval this 95% confidence interval are given here plus or minus 1.96 divided by square root of t that is how we are getting the confidence interval square root of t t is the sample size now if the these are the auto correlation coefficients at lag 1 we have this one lag 2 we have this one lag 3 this one lag 4 lag 5 lag 6 lag 7 and so on and here 
we have the partial autocorrelation function. These are the partial autocorrelation functions. This, this virus. And we find that for a white noise process, all the autocorrelation function and partial autocorrelation functions lie within the 95% confidence interval. So if we come across a chronogram where the, the correlation functions, both autocorrelation and partial autocorrelation functions, lie within the or between the 95% confidence interval, then that particular series is a white noise series. So here we have the property of the white noise series in terms of the chronograms. Now I am taking another case. Here we have an auto regressive process. This Excuse auto regressive me, process. Hello. Ah. Sir, I have a question. Sir. What is uh, ah, sir, actually, uh, I tried uh, using this ACF and PACF uh, for determining the lags for my MSRS model. Uh, but the thing is that, sir, uh, ACF in, 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 no, no, one thing. No, no, can you repeat it? Using the yes, sir. Actually, ACF I was using ah. PACF for lag determination ah. for my AR and MA model, RIMA model. So, like, whenever ah. they try to uh, use this model in a real time Somebody data. Else? So somebody else also is speaking. Please, one second, one second. Ah. Okay. Now, now come on. Now come on. Yes, sir. Actually, sir, what I'm saying ah. is that when I tried this ah. uh, making this A ACF and PACF uh, this uh, live table with the real data, uh, in your case, it was very circular, very uniform up and down. It was very like a very uniform wave. But whenever I try it uh, on the real time data or maybe uh, stock market or data of like five years real daily data, the patterns are very different. So how to determine the lag in that case? You want to get the optimum lag or, or the other ones? Uh, so I mean, I mean, uh, basically, uh, for, for my art modeling, uh, for my arts and genome modeling, uh, I just want to determine what should be the like in the mean equation, uh, the arima. What should be the lag for AR and MM? So in that case, you have to find out the optimum lag for fitting the model. Okay. Yes. Sir. For yes, sir. fitting the model. So see, in this case, the the entire the entire uh, for for example, this time series is for the entire period. And for the ACF and PACF, Gretel has taken by default. Gretel has taken mm -hmm. by default. This is a monthly data. This is a monthly data. Therefore, Gretel has taken two years series. Two years. That is 24 series as the lab. 24. Yes, sir. Okay. So, in most of the packages for graphical purpose, I think there may be a by default value. But for the estimation purpose, you have to give the optimum lag of lag that you have to consider in modeling. The optimum there is in every package, I think there is a there is a there is a command for getting the optimum lag. So before modeling, you have to find out that optimum lag. For example, in the afternoon, I shall show you how we do it in grading. And usually, this, usually this model is done. Uh, you are you are doing the war mod war modeling thing, right? Garch modeling. Garch modeling. Arch model. Arch model. Okay. So the in. In arch modeling, I think you automatically it is the lag is considered automatic. The optimal lag is considered automatically in most of the packages. You need not give it. I think so. I in EVs it, at least it is like that. In Gettel also it is like that. You need not give the lag. The optimum lag is taken. But usually if you are doing the doing the exponential gauge, then usually you are using only one lab. 
the model also will be fitted for one lab. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Now this is the time series approach of an auto regression process. This is uh, we know this is a uh, stationary one because we have a large number of mean reversions. Now this is the ACF and BSCF for the auto regression. See this. This is the first auto auto correlation coefficient. Second auto correlation coefficient. Third or or third order auto correlation coefficient. And we know these three are above the 95 percent confidence interval. So we say that we have significant spike for the first three labs. We have significant spike for the first three labs. But see the nature of this, this, this spikes. They are fast decay. They are fast decay. So for a stationary series, if the autocorrelation function shows fast decay, then we can we can we can assume that the given series is a stationary one. So this is a stationary series because we have the ACF with the fast decay. And now the PSCF we will use along with the ACF for identifying whether we have an AR process or an MA process. Now here find in PSCF we find one significant spike. That means we have an AR1 process. And this is stationary and here we have the order is 1. So we have a stationary AR1 process. That is our, that is the conclusion that we can make out of this. So for a stationary series, remember ACF will be fast decay. And PACF we will use along with the ACF to find the order of the AR. I'm not giving the MA process. MA process is the opposite of this. That is, if the PACF is fast decaying, and we have a significant spike in ACF, then we can take it as an indication of MA1. So that is why I have not given a place for MA process here. So MA, for the MA process, we have the opposite of this. That is for the PSCF is fast decaying and in ACF we have one significant spike for a stationary MA1 process. Now here, this is the time series problem of an ARMA process, ARMA11. So this also is a stationary one. We have the ACF and PSCF for the ARMA process here. Now remember, unfortunately, we know when we combine AR and MA process together, they will have the same properties of AR and MA, both AR and MA process. And therefore, it is very difficult to identify the order of the ARMA process from ACF and PACF. The only thing we can find out is whether it is stationary or not. If both are fast decaying, then our ARMA process is fast decaying, then our ARMA process is stationary. The order is not possible to determine. Even in, in the case of AR or MA process, actually, when we come to estimation, we have to do a lot of trial and error things. Because getting at the current value of a, a model, a time series model, ARMA model, or ARIMA model, is very difficult. We have to do a lot of trial and error. We have to estimate all the possible orders of AR, MA, and ARMA. Then, out of this, we will select one significant and adequate model, depending upon, yesterday, last day, I told you about the model selection, that is the information criteria, for which model we have the minimum information criteria, 
that you will select out of all the significant and adequate words. So that is the ALMA estimation procedure. I'm not giving it here. So this is for, a, for an integrated series. So evidently we do not have the, a large number of mean versions. So evidently this is not, not suggestible. And the SCF and PSCF for this non stationary series is like this. The SCF is very slowly decaying. Actually, theoretically, the SCF must be equal to 1. SCF must be equal to 1. SCF must be equal to 1. But here, since we are missing sample data, the sample formula has a particular a particular differentiation that means a, a, a particular pattern and that is why the ACF shows a small decay. But now here let us see even after 24 lab the ACF is not decaying that is it is not coming to zero. That is an indication of non stationary. So if the ACF is slow decaying then it is an indication of non stationary. The PSCF will usually tell us the order of the non stationary, whether we have one or two or three unit roots, but it need not be the actually theoretically it should be like that, but for the sample data it may not be like that. Actually, in the data that I have given, there is only one unit root, so we should have only one significant spike, but here it appears that we have two. It so happens with the, the sample data. Now this is the this is an stationary arch process, the time series plot, and this is the ACF and PSCF for the arch series. Now see it can so happen that sometimes a letter lag the value may cross the 95% confidence interval. Sometimes it can so happen, but even then we can take it as stationary one. This is a letter one. Now let us compare the integrated processes I1 and I0. As we have already seen, I1 series vantages widely. That is I0 on the other hand, the I0 series is mean reverting. So there may be direct or oscillatory convergence to the mean. Then I1 series has infinitely low memory of its past behavior. That is, I have we have already seen that the I1 series has a stochastic trend. That stochastic trend is the sum of or the accumulation of all the past random shows u u1 plus u2 plus u3 plus and so on. all the past shows or ut plus ut minus 1 plus ut minus 3 plus and so on so it, so we say that it has infinitely low memory of its past behavior that is the shows are persisting we have the persistence problem and this is even from the very slow decay of ACF, that is sample ACF, okay. Theoretically, there is no decay at all. All the PSCF will be equal to 1. ACF also will be equal to 1. Now, I0 series has a limited memory only. Because the shock effects are only transited. For the particular process, we have only one time show UT. And this is evident from the fast decay of the autocorrelation function. Now, this is the WPI all commodities in level variable. And if we take the first difference, we have approached like something like this. And if we take the second difference, then we get a large number of mean reversions. That is an indication that is that may be an indication that WPI includes 
Can you tell me how many unit roots? Anybody? The two unit roots, sir. Yeah. Possibly we will have two unit roots. Because the first difference is like this. We have only very few mean conversions. Anyway, remember the the polygram or the this time series approach. Need not tell us the true picture. Okay, to some extent the polygram will, but not the not the time series approach. So we have to go for either uh, to some extent the polygram and then. Definitely, we have to go for the unit root tests to find out how many unit roots we have. Now, coming back to the trench stationary process, ESP. So, we have a we can write a deterministic trench like this by T equals A plus. Vt plus ut. So this a plus vt will give us the deterministic trench. Here ut is a white noise process. We call this a trench stationary process because we have stationary fluctuations around this linear trench. A plus vt is the linear trench. Now for a non-stationary process, we know the mean changes with the time. So, if we take the expectation of this series, that is, if we take the mean of this series, we can find that this is equal to A plus B t, because expectation of U t, the mean of U t is zero. So, we get the mean of the trench stationary process as A plus B t. It is the expected, the mean is changing with time. It's a function of time. But, if we take the variance and constant one covariance of this deterministic trench, this TSP, we can find that both are constant. That is sigma misfit. The covariance is only a function of the lags, K only, not a function of time. So a TSP trench stationary process like this is it has a constant variance and a constant or independent variance and, and independent covariance. Both are independent of time. But the mean is a function of time. But we can, since this is a function, this uh, mean is a function of time, we can use this expectation of like or the regression of by D in terms of the estimated values of A and B, A hat plus B hat D for forecasting purpose. Forecasting the recent future only, not for a long time period, for a long future horizon. No, for a limited period of future periods, we can have the mean value of this one. Now, remember the trench stationary process and the difference stationary process. For the difference stationary process with a constant, all the characteristics, mean, variance, and covariance are all functions of time. But for a trench stationary process, variance and covariance are independent of time. That is the covariance stationarity is met. The only problem is with the mean. Mean is a function of time. But if we do not have a constant, if we don't, we do not have a constant, then also we will have the mean in terms of the trend. So remember the difference between TSP and DSP. Now, how can we make a trench stationary process stationary? Hmm. 
Now, do you remember the different stationary process we make stationary by differencing it? So the trench stationary process we can make stationary by removing the trench or detrenching it. So we have the trench given in terms of expectation of y t. So if we go back here, expectation of y t is a plus b t. So if we remove this a plus b t out of this y t, then y t minus expectation of y t will be equal to this u t, which is stationary. So that is the process of d t y t minus a plus b t. So we are removing the trench d t. So we can make TSP stationary by removing the trench that is d t. Now in a regression framework, how do we detrench a series? Can anybody tell me? In a regression framework, how can we detrench it? Suppose we have a TSP in terms of a TSP in terms of some other variables. All the variable, all the variable, say yt and xt, both are TSP. And we want to, we want to make, make both TSP, that is trench stationary process, that is making it stationary. How can we make it stationary without doing manually or in Excel or otherwise without subtracting that particular trench? Is there any, any, any method for detrenching in the context of Regression analysis. Anybody? Or first difference or taking log? Taking the log. No, no. That will not detrench. That will that will that will give us some uh, some some something something called something uniform. That is it. Yes, yes, that is it will reduce the variability in the yes. In the, in the values of variables, variability. It will not detrench. Anybody else? For the difference, it looks the difference. Only option I look, it looks for difference, a second difference with the augmented degree polar test. No, 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 a little, a little louder. Sir, I was saying the first difference, first difference with the help of augmented degree polar test. So first to do the Dickey Fuller unit group test. No, for a TSP, we need not do the Dickey Fuller unit group test. Okay, okay. Because there is no, it is not a difference stationary process. For a difference stationary process only, we need to do the unit root test. For a TSP, there is no unit root. There is only a trench. How can we deep trench it? How can we remove the trench? Usually we do we do the detrenching like this. That is, we first estimate the a plus b t, get the estimated value. Then that estimated value we will subtract from y t, y t minus a plus b t. Then the that the remaining the remainder, the residual will be a a, a detrenched stationary value. So instead of doing this detrenching directly like this, suppose we have two TSP variables, trench stationary process variables, that is yt and xt. Okay, both are trench stationary process. And we have a we have a regression equation yt as a function of xt. So we regress yt on xt. The problem is. Both the variables are TSP. And there is a trench in both YT and XT. So the, the regression coefficients, the estimates, will not be free from that trench. That is, we will not get the true value of effect of XT on YT. That we will get after removing the trench from YT and XT. 
and then doing the regression with the detrended values of yt and xt. That is, we'll do a regression of detrended yt or detrended xt. Then we will get the pure effect of xt or yt. But that is a cumbersome process. We have to do several times. First, we do the first we do a regression of yt or time. Get the trend. Then minus subtract this trend from yt. Then we do another regression of xt or time. Get its trend. Remove that trend and get the residual from xt. So the two residuals are detrended values. Then we do the regression with the residuals, the detrended values. It's a cumbersome work. It will take a lot of time. But actually, actually in multiple regression, we have a method for detrending such cases. And uh, that is actually, that is the beauty of multiple regression. Multiple regression does it automatically. That is, if we do a multiple regression of yt or xt and time, we include a time variable explicitly in the regression. Then, there is a theorem called the Frisch-Vogue theorem. According to Frisch-Vogue theorem, if we include a time variable, a trend variable in a multiple regression framework, then the presence of the time will detrench automatically all other variables in the regression. So the partial regression coefficient of that xt will be the true effect of xt on yt. That is the, de the effect of detrended xt on detrended yt. So remember that if we have a DSP, all the variables are having, or some of the variables in our multiple regression are having a trend. We need not go for first to detrending and then doing all the all, 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 all the regression. We just include a time variable in the regression, in the multiple regression. That the presence of that trend will automatically detrench all the variables. And that is the beauty of this fresh work theorem. Okay. So, so in general, we are detrending a variable like this. And now this yt minus expectation of yt will, will be a stationary variable. So here we have a TSP. See, remember this is there is a trend. Like this, the trend is equal to 1.5 plus 0.5 t. And here we have the detrended series. So once we have removed the trend, we get an almost stationary series. So we will have a break uh, so, uh, at 11:30. Uh, uh, so oh yes, you can like like you, uh, approximately you can conclude like that. Yeah, now it's okay. eleven twenty-eight. Yeah. Okay. So we can have a break now, right? And what team we are meeting? So eleven eleven forty-five. We will come back. Okay. Eleven forty-five. Sir, sir, one more thing. Yeah, if you okay. want to conclude this slide, you can conclude, and after that, we can have a break. No, 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 no. The, oh, both, the seat, both the both uh, the. I have combined the there. Okay, so okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So okay. Then we can have a break. Snehit, uh, can you stop yeah. the recording? Yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, so I am also quitting the sharing. Okay. Yeah. I'm stopping.